Welcome to Look, Listen, Laugh. My guest this episode has been a prominent face in film, TV, and theatre for well over 50 years now. Uh, I always knew who he was, but it wasn't until I saw him live that I was just truly blown away. It was a show that he co-wrote and uh, performed in called Looking Through a Glass Onion about the life and music of John Lennon. And I recently saw him in his latest touring show, Radio Luxembourg. We're going to explore his favourite album, film, and book. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with John Waters. And speed, action. <laughs> John. Hey, Joel, good to see how you, you doing? Mate. Mm. Thank you for in inviting me uh, to your beautiful abode. Oh, look, it's a pleasure. It's always nice to have uh, visitors out here in the uh, Southern Highlands. Uh, it's only two hours from Sydney, as yes. you discovered. Um, it's great. And, and also, too, you know, driving through here it reminds me of England. Yes. You know, just the countryside, the, yeah. the hedges, the stone walls. It's yeah, very... yeah, dry stone walls. I mean, I'm from London, but my um, wife Zoe is from Leeds in Yorkshire. And um, she likes the climate here. Right. I'm not so mad about the cold winters, to be mm. honest. Uh, in you fact, had enough of that when you uh, were younger. Really, totally, yeah. But but Zoe likes the colder weather, the, mm. the, the sort of humidity and heat. And you only have to go from here down onto sea level because we're 750 metres up here. And you, if you look at, over the escarpment here, you look down at the coast, you can see people who are eight degrees warmer than you are. <laughs> They're in their um, board shorts. I, I know, yeah, around. I know. And I go, yeah, I'm here in my scarf. And like, <laughs> uh, but uh, it suits Zoe, and she's, uh, you know, she's worked very hard to uh, keep this whole outfit together, this yeah, water's nice. family. And uh, That's great. I thought, okay, let's go there. Yeah, great. Mm. Let me just adjust so oh, your mic is just uh, Did I touch there. it? <laughs> yeah. We were just, I was just talking to you about... Uh, as long as it's recording, we'll be yeah. fine. Yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I'll be I'll be able to edit around that. I'm sure. Oh, well, no, let's keep it in. Come yeah, on, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. All, you know, what the, the these hell? These podcasts are very natural. Yeah, you know. What are we supposed to be professionals? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. when you when you first came out here to Australia, like, yeah. you, you, what was it that? Because you you end up doing one of the first productions. Well, the first production of Hair, right? Yes. Yeah. Out, out here. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, I think the Sydney production of Hair was the, th the third one worldwide after New York and London. So, right. Um, I, I didn't come out specifically for that, but I came out having been in uh, a band, uh, it was a kind of blues slash pop band that I was in in London, it wasn't particularly successful. We never had a recording contract, which was the frustrating thing, so... Uh, was I, that the riots? Yes, the yeah. riots. Uh, so I basically, you know, we had an interesting time. You know, I was, I, they were slightly older than me and they'd asked me to join their band because they heard me singing at the school I was at, Hampton Grammar School. And um, it, it, an interesting history of Hampton Grammar School is it produced a lot of people in the British rock industry, right. uh, notably Brian May of Queen. He was like, I think, two or three years above me in the school, maybe two years above me. Uh, I didn't know at the time that I'd been to school. I only found out that I was at school with Brian really? Ray in the last five years or right. so. Yeah, and it's in his uh, Wikipedia bio. But, but two uh, years is very also, different. Though. Yes, yeah. You, know, when yeah, you're you in don't school, hang out with the other years. Someone two all. years older may, might as well but, be your parents. You know, right. it's, like, it's such totally. a big age yeah. gap at that age. Nowadays, I notice that the culture in schools is uh, to for the, the years to mix a lot more than they did right. in okay. my day. I noticed okay. that with, with uh, my kids. Right. But also... Um, uh, yeah, um, Paul Samuel Smith was the Yardbirds. He was their bass player. He, he, right. I did know because he was a friend with my brother. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I became in this band that a couple of members, myself and, and the founder of the band, were at Hampton. The other guys came from elsewhere, and um, I learned to play the bass in a very rudimentary way. Just it was a way of getting me into the <laughs> the band, so I could Colin sing. Stuart we had, Sutcliffe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a singer who was uh, like the front man, so I wasn't the main singer, but right. he, he wanted another singer, Tony, the band leader, because he didn't sing himself. So um, so that's what I've been doing for on and off for the last couple of years. And um, as I said, not getting anywhere, doing local gigs and doing all right, but you know, we weren't as good as the Yardbirds or the other local bands. So um, it sort of petered out and I went, I, uh, my uncle had been in Australia and uh, he toured around uh, in the outback as a as a traveling bookkeeper he went from one station to another doing their books right. he worked for a, a pastoral company called Clark and Tate and um, he told stories about Australia and the outback and everything I thought that sounds interesting and I thought well if you pay 10 quid 
to go to Australia, it's it's you're ostensibly immigrating. Mm. But if you uh, if you then um, want to come back after two years, you don't have to repay the Australian government what they subsidised you to go there in the first place. So I thought two-year working holiday, a bit like I consider myself a sort of nowadays a, a forerunner of the backpackers, really. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. like a two-year working holiday. And that's what I thought I'd do. And I went mm -hmm. to Queensland with this one name that my uncle had uh, given me. And uh, so my, my I was, it was January in London and it had been snowing. And I arrived in Brisbane, got a job on a station through my uncle's friend as a station hand. God knows how, I didn't know anything about it. But the guy I went to see, he said, uh, uh, oh, you want to go and work on a station? He said, well, no other bastard does, so you might as well go <laughs> here. And he said, well, I can get you. <laughs> and uh, so I arrived at, in uh, like close to 40 degree temperatures in Longreach in central Queensland. Oh, wow, Longreach, in, yeah. 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 And, uh, and I, I remember the, arriving at the station, and this, 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 the station, the, the, the uh, foreman, who was like the you know the head station hand, he, he sort of looked up and down the platform, and, and the train moved off, and there was just me le and him left. He looked at me and he went, and he walked up to me, and he said, he looked me up and down, he said, Are "You the new man for Bimra?" I said, "Yeah." He said. "Well, fuck me." <laughs> <laughs> but the, then he took me off to the pub. <laughs> and uh, we drank about 150 beers and then drove to Bimmera Station, which sure. is like <laughs> about 75 miles away. It's funny, as you're telling me this, it's so cinematic. You, you know, <laughs> just arriving on the train, the train leaving you, yeah, the lone yeah, person yeah. on the, him just walking up, you know. It um, was it's like being in the dust belt. You yeah, know? yeah, there, there was me, you know, like strange looking white pommy kid yeah. and him this sort of a bronzed Aussie with his uh, Cobra sure. and his uh, R.M. Williams boots. Sure. But... um. You know, look, I had a great time there uh, working on the station, not really learning. I mean, I learned a lot about... I saw a part of Australia that most Australians, I realised, didn't know. Don't, right. Australians live on the coastal fringe of the mm -hmm. continent, you know. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, of course, the, the outback life is a stuff of legend, and uh, yet, you know, very few people, comparatively speaking, actually live it. Right, and I uh, didn't stay long enough to become expert in anything on the running of a of a sheep station. But I, I saw it all, you know, and I helped with the there's a roust about with the shearing and stuff like that. And when I came uh, back to uh, eventually, I, I said to the station manager, "I probably better leave because you know I'm not really cut out for this life." And he said, "You're right, you're not. But <laughs> it's been lovely having you here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <no>. Thanks, Jono. <laughs> Here's your train fare home." So I went back to Sydney and I uh, came to Sydney, you know, having only really touched ground there. Right. And um, I went to um, various little sort of auditions for bass players in garage bands and things at the same time as w working in sort of labouring jobs for a little while. And, and then uh, eventually I got into the entertainment industry, which my father was a part of because he was an actor, yes. uh, by... Uh, reading an article in the Sydney Morning Herald about a movie that was being shot on, not far from here, near Nowra. It was called, it's a working title, it was called The Return of the Boomerang. It was eventually called Adam's Woman. And um, I, I, it said that the, the director, Philip Laycock, had, was casting it and getting his crew together and he was staying at the Siebeltown House in oh, Elizabeth wow. Bay. Oh, wow, yeah, and iconic. I, I saw this name, Philip Laycock, and I thought, I my dad's worked with him. He's, I, I remember him telling stories about Philip Laycock. So I just went to the Siebel townhouse and uh, I said, I've got an appointment to see Philip Laycock. And somebody said, oh, well, he's, uh, in, he's in suite such and such on the second floor. And I went up there <laughs> and the, outside the door of the suite, there was a, he'd set up a sort of reception desk with, there, were, there was this supermodel, uh, <laughs> so it seemed to me, uh, sitting at the desk and Yes, uh, can I help you? I said, I've got an appointment to see Mr. Laycock. And she looked in her book and she said, I don't see your name here. And I said, oh, maybe maybe it's just, I don't know, perhaps uh, perhaps it just went astray somewhere. But, he, you know, he's a very good friend of my father's, Russell Waters. And um, she went, oh, excuse me, wait a minute. And she went inside this suite and I could hear her voices inside. She left the door a bit open and mm. I heard this English voice saying, well, I know Russell Waters. He's a lovely chap, but I've never heard of his fucking son. <laughs> and, then, and then I heard the war voices again. She came up and she said, Mr. Laycock will see you now. <laughs> so I went in there, 
he was a lovely guy and he said, oh, well, you know, you're he said, no, you're not really an actor, are you? I said, no. He said, but look, uh, we'll find you a job. So he gave me a job on the production as a, uh, a gopher, a runner. Right, right. So I went down to, uh, they sent me down to Nowra. And on that production, I met every actor in Australia of the day who was playing little guest parts in this movie, mm. which, which starred um, Bo Bridges, the older brother of Jeff Bridges. Yes. And... Um, Jane Merrow, the English uh, actress, and Andrew Keir, and a couple of others. And um, they, so among all these Australian actors was um, Helen Morse, a beautiful Australian actress. And uh, I got chatting with her, and I'd been singing, playing guitar, and around the campfire. And she said, you should audition for hair. Uh, my friend Jim Sharman is, is casting. He doesn't want people who've been in, on stage in Broadway musicals. He doesn't want that kind of performer at all. He, he's just getting, you know, street kid singers and performers. So uh, I went and uh, she, she told me about the auditions when I went along and after about three or four different auditions I found myself in here. There I was in, um, you know, on stage in the, the, not just any old thing, but the sensational new production. You know, we were all unknown, but the play itself was the star. It was sure. like the thing of the day and it was outrageous because there was... You know, there was um, uh, there was nudity. It's not, of course, like we weren't naked the whole time. There was like twenty second stationary tableau of new backlit of sure. nudity. But it, that people always say, oh, "Are you naked on stage?" <laughs> but it was mainly the contentious issues about the Vietnam War, the, um, the language. The really, uh, it was a very anarchistic show. It was sure. Brilliant, uh, and that got me um, that got me working. Um, I mean, I, I Reg Livermore joined the show after we'd been going for a few months. And I think it was Harry M. Miller's attempt to try and get some discipline into the cast because we were what Jim had wanted. Right, know? right. <laughs> and, uh, we, you know, after three or four months, it was getting a bit ragged. So uh, he got a few professionals in. Among them was Reg Livermore. And he thought Reg would sh bring us into line. But I think, actually, we just got Reg stoned and he made it like <laughs> You us. brought him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we like Reg. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he had, he had an agent, uh, Gloria Payton, who um, uh, came backstage afterwards and said, "Oh, you, you know, you show promises a stage performance." That gave me her card, and I was planning to go back to England, which I did yeah. in '71. But when I came back to Australia, I just went, "I'll go and see that Gloria Payton lady." So she was, she became. Really, the mo the most important uh, woman in my life at that time. <laughs> yeah, instrumental. Hope. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, she was great with me. She sent me for jobs where she actually sort of told white lies about what I'd done in order to give me some sort of appeal to potential employers mm, for see, them to see you at least. Lack yeah. of experience. They were saying, oh, no, "Yeah, don't just send us someone off the street." And Gloria said, "I'm sending you to see so and so." Don't make a liar of me. And yeah. like she was like, oh, okay, no stress then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that's great though to have someone to see the talent in you and to be yeah. able to put you forward with the right people. Yeah, you know. To... Well, Gloria Payton, she ran a, an agency called ICS International Casting Services, and she was in those days. This was nineteen seventy-one when I went to see her. Sixty-nine when I'd first seen her, and wow. um, she was the only major talent agency or acting agency in in Sydney they were you know they were very scattered and uh, the uh, the others were kind of small fry she was the one at the go-to agent for big casting director for movies she'd she'd been a casting director on on the uh, on the film the Adam's woman wow. and um, so to have her backing me was just fantastic and I and I so I had was at this crossroads and I was one of the the rock opera singers mm. around the young sort of you know hippie uh, rock actors if you like uh, along with John English mm -hmm. who started up um, with Superstar and uh, again you know Harry and Miller was involved so so I had um, Gloria offering to be my agent Harry uh, Offering me, uh, offering to manage me, and and um, you know, to sort of manage a recording career, and I, I was so excited by the whole idea of being an actor yeah. that I sort of made that kind of choice. I couldn't have, you know, I had a, a little crossroads to go yeah, to, yeah. but uh, so you know, I just ended up like for years and years. I, I, you know, I had a I had a good career in film and television, but I, I. Um, I always sang with my friends, and a lot of my friends were still the music musicians that from the old days. And um, 
you know, among, among those uh, things that I did were a lot of musical shows on stage. You know? Sure. Even though sure. The, with, with a, a sort of Broadway-style musical, I love those too. I love Broadway musicals. And, um, you know, to, in later years to be on stage playing Professor Higgins and playing Captain Von Trapp and, yeah. you know, uh, I love that. And my, whenever I'm on stage, I prefer, really, to be in something that's also got music. Right, right. Um, and because, uh, um, you know, I just feel like music is such a great communicator. Um, and uh, it, it communicates emotions mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a way that a, a plain spoken word sometimes can't. You know? But with the production, because the first time I saw you on stage was the Looking Through Glass Onion. Right, yeah. And I was just so blown away by how, how you were able to connect to John Lennon on, a, on an emotional level. You know, it was yeah. like, because, you know, musically and everything, it was great, yeah, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but just like <laughs> beyond being able to get deep into his psyche and, mm. and feel like John Lennon's talking to me right now. Yeah. You know, that, that to me, when I, 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 when I walked out, I was, I was just blown away by it. Well, that's what I wanted. I wanted it to, to be, I wanted to communicate in a sort of um, internal head to head way with the audience because I didn't dress up to look like John Lennon. I didn't wear little round glasses. I, mean, I wear these now, but they're just mine. Um, they just <laughs> happen to be slightly round. But uh, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I, w I would consciously wore clothes that weren't Lennon esque. And I was saying to the audience, really, look, here's a guy on stage who isn't John Lennon, but you're going to hear the thoughts of John Lennon coming out of him. And yes. so I used the Lennon voice and I talked about, you know, what I imagine. I, there were a few direct quotes from Lennon's things that he'd said, but mostly I expand, when I was writing the, the monologue, I just expanded on what I thought he meant by certain things, you know, because sure. I don't think he ever got a chance to fully express himself. You know, they started, the Bible Belt started burning all the Beatle memorabilia in the United States because he said the Beatles are more popular than Jesus. And, mm. you know, so I just had his thought, what he, what he was thinking, well, you know, I'm not trying to be um, blaspheming in any way here. I'm just saying that the people, less and less people are going to church these days and more and more people are buying our records. Mm. You know, that's what's happening. Anyway. I'm only saying what's happening. Right. I'm, he wasn't making a judgment. Yeah, I'm not trying to make some yeah, big yeah, sweeping... Yeah, we're not better than anyone yeah. or... Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I liked the fact that I had this sort of strange power that I gave myself to be a sort of spokesperson for jo the thoughts of John Lennon because sure. this was 10 years after he'd been ass assassinated. Yeah. yeah. And where, where was it, where did the initial thoughts come from to, to put that production on? Well, the thoughts came uh, to me in a, in a, just a, a beginning of a show. I thought I'd like to, I'd like to do something that, uh, you know, I'd been an actor who'd, who'd become uh, pretty well known to the Australian public. Mm. And I thought, but, what I want to do is to do something that combines me with the music that I started out in and singing uh, with what I've since learned as an actor and how to you know be sort of uh, on stage and in control of an audience. Mm. And, um, and I'd like it to be a small, I, I use the word one man show, but I realized that I needed another musician on stage with me. And, mm. um, and that ended up being uh, Stuart Darietta. Yeah. And, and it's a beautiful dynamic between yeah, you yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, you know, you, 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 there's a real symbiosis going on there. Yes, like, yes. Dewey and I knew each other, and we'd started writing songs together. And um, uh, I, I sort of said, "Why don't we do this this glass onion thing?" That, you know, I've got in my head. And um, he said, "Yeah, let's give it a go." Uh, so <laughs> we, great. we uh, there was a, a venue called the Tilbury Hotel in Wormaloo, mm. and um, uh, I, I rang the boys around it and said, look, uh, uh, I, I had spoken to them, um, you know, early, earlier on and they, they, there was nothing doing there, but they rang me back and said, we've got a space, somebody's not going to, you know, somebody's pulled out of their, their three-week season. Um, Have you got something you can do here? And I said, yeah, I've got a show. And they said, oh, great, what is it? I said, I'll let you know. <laughs> and then I went to Stewie and I said, we've got a place to do this show, so let's, let's start doing it. And, you know, we put it together and, and rehearsed, wrote and rehearsed it and did it in six, seven weeks, something like wow. that. Mm. I had it on at the Tilbury and I had no idea whether people would take to what it was we were doing. 
Uh, we worked out guts up. Stewie worked incredibly hard making a few uh, tracks. In the early days, we used a quarter-inch Rebox machine with, with some backing tracks on right. it, as well as what we were playing live. And um, it, this was a kind of a good tool to have when you're playing around pubs and things sure. like that. And uh, I just thought, if it's everybody going to sit there silently going, what the fuck was that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but uh, let's see. And when we finished the first, the very first show, the whole room just went vroshka, and wow. uh, the, the, the roof came off. Fantastic. I thought they'd been sitting there with bated breath throughout the whole show because it wasn't a big laugh and cheer type of right, show. It was a very right. kind of the people absorbed that show. And at the end, when it was over, they just this huge release came out. It was like, it was pretty incredible. Yeah. Really. yeah. And then you, you took it around the world. It yeah, was... it, en it ended up expand. You know, we added a band for a, the next, uh, we did a tour just as a two man show. We added a band for a while. Mm -hmm. And that was our time when we went to the West End. I mean, um, we, Stewie um, always attracts really, really great musicians because he's such a good, you know, fun guy to work with. And, um, he is. Uh, so we had a fabulous band. Uh, didn't succeed financially in London. We got some great reviews. Right. We got what, the two bad reviews we got, or sort of dismissive reviews, were unfortunately the very first one to come out in the Evening Standard, which comes out. The, the first it's the first one to come out so mm. you, you have an opening night and then the next morning you get the reviews but that the the the, uh, the the next morning but one but on the next morning in the evening standard which is the daytime paper mm. this bad you know sort of dismissive review came out and uh, I think sometimes I think the other reviewers wait till, till they've seen what other people have written before right, they... Before right, they, yeah, before they... Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, because the problem with it was not that, that, that we thought, oh dear, maybe the show's bad. We, we just knew it wasn't because yeah. the, that opening night had been a massive standing ovation in the criteria. So it's just this one-off guy. People loved it, yeah. Uh, and um, so, yeah, we, we didn't do the, enough business, but we, when we came back from London... After you know three months of slogging away through a freezing winter in London, losing money, uh, we organised another Australian tour mm -hmm. in which we direct from London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from yeah, yeah, the smash hit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but because I've seen the show a few times, and every time the audience is the audience reaction yeah, is yeah, huge. Yeah, it is, and yeah. it's interesting because I've seen it. I saw it at the Enmore Theatre. You know, packed crowd with the full band. Yes. But then I saw one of the um, runs you did at the Sydney Opera House too, yeah. where it's just you and just the Stewie. Yeah. And I felt... Even more intense in a way. Yeah, yeah but yeah. It, I felt that the yeah. uh, it, it hits you at a deeper level when it's just the two of you. Yeah. Because as an audience member, I found it gave me... It gave it more room to breathe. Yes. Right? I, 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 yeah. And, and how, how, I was interested to find out what your thoughts are on between performing it with the full band to just you and Stewie. Well, when we went back... To doing it as a two-man show, I thought I love the, the you know I just love the, the 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 musical richness that the band provided. And then yes. I thought you know it's this has always been actually not so much about the music. The music, the lyrics of the song provide an additional kind of thing to the monologue, and mm -hmm. the two are intertwined. And when the audience starts to get off on the on the music with the you know the electric guitars going and the kit and the bass and everything, it, it maybe takes their mind out of that intense little place that I've worked hard to put them in. Yes. And um, so I think both Stewie and I realised that it was it was basically a, a, an acoustic two-man show. Yeah. Acoustic piano, acoustic guitar. Uh, I think Stewie used two keyboards, he has, so he had, um, he had an electric keyboard and a piano. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was it. He had a mm. stomp box for uh, percussion. Mm -hmm. And so you never got that big switch Monologue into song, out of song, back into monologue. It was all nice and uh, integrated. Yes. And I, I think that's why the show did work better in that form. Yeah, yeah. just that intimacy yeah. that you yeah, yeah. would feel yeah. in that. It was never a, a show that was designed to play in a big concert hall to 2,000 people. You know? Sure, yeah. sure. Although, you know, seeing it like at the Enmore Theatre, it still translated like in a, yeah. in a big Yeah, and uh, whenever we did, like you that. know... 
to make a decent living out of it, you need to get a few people in. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true. But then, but looking yeah. at the economic side of it too, when it's just you and Stewie, yeah. you know, <laughs> hotel rooms, flights, fees, yeah, it's yeah. all, you know, it's a lot, a lot smaller. Yeah, yeah, I think we were, we, we were affected by, we were on the road with the band once and uh, I remember, uh, or oh, a couple of times, we, uh, we, we were playing in the same venue in the small theatre while the big theatre was used for stand up, notably Billy Connolly. Oh, we were in Adelaide yeah. and we were in the Dunstan Playhouse. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. And sure. uh, you know, a lot of... And then That's a the, great venue too. Yeah, but in the big Adelaide Festival Hall, <laughs> Billy. Billy came on <laughs> with a banjo and a microphone <laughs> and that was it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, well mind you, you know, he, he's playing to 2,000 people, but he deserves it because he's a one-off unique genius. Yes. <laughs> and he can, he can do what he likes with those people. Sure, you know? sure. But well, same, well, same with, you know, just good guys like Jamon. We'd be, he'd be playing at the big room in Canberra when we were playing this, the small room. Yeah. And I'd look at the monitors in the, in the green room thinking, <laughs> he's got a full house. <laughs> yeah. but that's, they're both great rooms there in, in Canberra as well. The big theatre yeah. space. But that small, the, yeah. the small, is, and it's not that small, it's what, five no. or six hundred seats, yeah. but it's beautiful. It's yeah. You can really feel that It's just a good medium-sized theatre to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I've uh, well, I, the, I, I've played the, the my solo shows in the smaller one, <laughs> right. you know, the Playhouse, there, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the Canberra, which is only like a you know 150, yeah, 200 yeah, seater. Yeah, but, yeah. but still, I always find Canberra audiences. I always yeah. find a consistently good audience. Yeah, lately we've been uh, playing at uh, the Canberra Street Theatre, which is a nice one as well. Oh, the right. University precinct. Oh, there. really? Yeah, okay, it's really good. Is, is that where you took uh, um, the Luxembourg? Yeah, show? we yeah. we yeah we started off doing um, the the Lennon Songbook which was our post-Glass Onion show. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Wait, and I saw that too at the... That was great. I saw yeah. that at the, um, the Orpheum Theatre. Yeah, so that was our chance, you know, because of copyright issues and everything, we, we didn't get our, our licence renewed. So we thought, well, what we can do without any licence from the Lennon estate is we can do a set of John Lennon songs. And it, it kind of... So we definitely did it with the band, of course. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, it, it was just put us... And me personally back into that place where I'm front man of a band mm -hmm. doing some great songs yeah. and I'm chatting to the audience as myself. Sure. You know, I didn't, I wasn't locking myself in any little box. Yes. I was just able to sort of riff, have yeah, free reign. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. It was yeah. really good. And the, the shows that we've done since, including this new Radio Luxembourg show, is it's the same for me. I'm doing a lot of not just one artist's songs, but heaps of the best rock songs, particularly the Brit rock songs of the 60s, all my favourites, and um, uh, and I'm able to just be myself. You know? But it's great with this show that it's coming from a personal place. Like I can tell when you yeah. were saying, <laughs> you know, when you were talking about what the song means to you. Yeah. And, and then afterwards I'm thinking, well, you would have seen a lot of this stuff because yeah. being around in London in the 60s when you were, you, you would have had incredible access yeah. to seeing all these great I was very lucky musicians. as a teenager. Um, you know, like 14, 15, 16, 17, all through those years, the British rock thing was really happening strongly. And I lived in uh, South West London, very near one of the top venues of the day, Eel Pie Island in Twickenham. And um, it was, you know, it was a licensed place, converted boat shed. It had been, it, they used to have Akabilk and the jazz men and stuff. And then they realised that the rhythm of blues and rock had mm -hmm. taken over and they had rock nights. And I went and there. I mean, the house band there was a band um, with a great organ player called Brian Auger and uh, singer Julie Driscoll. They were called Brian Auger and Trinity, and they were a blues rock band, they were top notch. And Long John Baldry was uh, one of the sort of almost like a resident performer there. But all the all the acts went through there. So, you know, the Who and uh, Manfred Mann, and um, you know, they all they were all playing there. And I saw them all at one stage or another. And I, and I tell stories about Eel Payan, you know, Chris, seeing Chris Farlow there, who's a great English soul singer, mm. and doing, doing um, one of his songs, Out of Time. And uh, it does, it, it, it brings back the, the time when I fell in love with this music. And also, I, I, I loved, as a young English kid, the fact that we'd taken an American music form and we were we were kind of, in a sense, improving on it and sending it back to yes. the Americans. And that there's sometimes the subject matter would be very English, like the Kinks. You know, Ray Davis wrote songs, you know, featuring Waterloo Bridge. And uh, mm. and I tell a little story about my dad. And, 
taking me to a chicken rotisserie on Waterloo Bridge. So these things like make people laugh, but they 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 do link me with everything you know that was going on at the time. Sure, yeah. sure. No, you and you and you feel that with the connection when you're. See, it, it's interesting when you watch some people singing a song that you know, and they're essentially reciting the song. Yeah, here's you know, the song. It but, starts here and it ends there. Yeah, <laughs> but the great thing about watching you is you, you put yourself, you see that there's a personal yeah, connection yeah. to this music. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and it just takes it to a deeper level, I find. Yes, I can't really help doing that. I mean, the fact that uh, I'm able to do this, you know, to do these songs that I love so much and all of my generation loves and mm. knows these songs and and you know you, you can take a song that um, I've, I've chosen a lot of them that aren't necessarily played all the time and most of them are hardly ever played live so I'm, you know to 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 take uh, like for the odd hits like peter sarstitz where do you go to my lovely i do that and i thought it's, you know, it's this, it's this sort of Franco folky kind of thing. Will it? Will it? Will the audience still love it? Of course, the baby boomer audience loves it, but everybody seems to love it. And when I finish, it gets one of the biggest reactions of the night because it is a beautiful song, actually. Yeah. But I remember it was one of those songs that was played so much on the radio that you people used to go, "Oh, not that. Where do you go to, my fucking lovely?" Again? <laughs> but in fact, it is a great song. It is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah there was when you guys were in Canberra. I'm oh, no, sorry, in, in Wollongong. Yes. Doing the um, performing arts center down there we were on i was doing the show with arj barker in the theater next door yeah. and i um and after i got off stage you guys were starting and i snuck around <laughs> to up the back where ad man was and yeah, uh, yeah. the sound guy watching the um and i just snuck in for like one and a half songs but you're doing the moody blues go now yeah and it was i, I was just blown away by it and yeah. and i uh, i hadn't heard the song in years and for the next week, I just couldn't get it out of my head. It was just going around and yeah. around in my head, and I just thought, "Wow, what a great rendition you you did of that!" Got a, such a good band, you know. Stewie's um, uh, put together the you know the same guys that we've played with a hell of a lot. There's um, Greg Henson on drums and Tony Mitchell, the former yes. Sherbet bass player, and Paul Burton on guitar. And we've got um, Joe Elms, who's a fabulous um, singer, and she uh, is. Uh, plays in, multi instrumentalist as well, and she she was like great because these these things are very big on backing vocals, and Joe's really good at organising all the harmonies and so on. And um, so you know, it's a it's a it's a great bunch of guys to to be playing these songs with, and uh, I'm really loving it. I actually dropped playing my, my, myself. I normally you know all through the glass onion. Most of our shows I played acoustic guitar, but I like the idea for this of being a kind of '60s band front man yes. who just could wander around and hold the microphone yep. and do all that. So it gave me another whole sort of aspect to performing the songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great to, uh, yeah, I was, I was lucky to, to see it when you're at the, um, in Sydney at the yeah, Ritz yeah. Theatre. Yeah. yeah. And, and on that, because uh, I was talking to Stewie and he was saying how you guys were on the road, uh, you know, kind of non-stop and you had um, an early morning and you had like a, a big trip between the last few gigs yeah. and I know what it's like to get run down like doing yeah, but yeah. with me doing stand up I can kind of you know I can get through it but when you're <laughs> fronting a yeah, concert yeah. and singing and it was at yeah. the point so where it was Ritz touch show, and go yeah that was show I, I just that morning I went oh, I don't think I've got much voice in it. And it doesn't very often happen to me ah. and then as the day went on it, it normally it clears up and it wasn't getting better and we were getting close to showtime I thought I'm going to have to just just do this. I'm just going to have to sing these songs, you know, whatever it sounds like, you know. And it's not, I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, I did it. It was, it was not, it was, it, um, my voice was definitely wrecked. But I don't know, for some reason. But it worked. The show, uh, yeah, the yeah. show carried on. Yeah, but, you had people standing yeah, ovation yeah. at the end, people on their yeah, feet. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, but it's but for watching that from a performance perspective, just knowing what you're going through and what you're delivering. Yeah, I was so impressed. I was like, <laughs> "Wow, this is like this is a true pro here." Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You, the you show must go on. You know, you don't sort of suddenly say, "Sorry, give everybody their money back. I can't go on. I can't yeah, go on." Yeah, yeah. No, you just can't do that. And you, know, you just got to go on and do but it. Do you think that's something like from so many years doing it, like you, yeah. you know, okay, I, I can, you know, I, I, yeah. I, I can handle this. Yeah. It's, I basically think that um, you know when 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 all those people are there, whatever it is that's not quite right, you just go and you give them like as much as you possibly can uh, and, and more. If it, mm. you know, you, you just they, if if I couldn't sing a note and I just had to spend the evening talking, I would have done it. Yeah, you know? sure, uh, sure. It, Just just to. Uh, 
to give them a good time yeah. you know, and to make, to make sure that they uh, enjoyed themselves. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, so, and you've got to, you, to, to actually pull out of something and not do it is, is, is a horrible, horrible feeling. There's, there's, there's a, been one or, once or twice when, you know, it's been impossible for me to through, I don't know what um, uh, reason, but various reasons that mean you just simply can't go on. You might have a temperature of 105 or something. But, um, you know, other than that, you just go through any adversity. And you yeah. Mm. Now, and it's amazing what you can pull out when it comes down to it, to yeah. have to do that. Like, yeah, you just, uh, if I didn't, if I hadn't had to do uh, a show that night, I probably would have been worse. Right, You know, right. so the, the, the necessity of doing it just lifted it enough to be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I had that the first time uh, I got, like, it was like an audition to do the comedy store yeah. when I was starting out. And I, and I was leading up to this this date, uh, preparing for it, and then I got the worst cold. Like I was yeah. just like uh, bedridden all day. But I was yeah. like, I, I can't back out of this. Like, no, no. I've been waiting for this opportunity, and the manager was there to see yeah, me, yeah. and I was like in bed all day. Today. Oh my god! <laughs> and it was I turned up there feeling like death. But the moment I hit the stage, bam, it was on, and then I walked off yeah. and, uh, again. Yeah. Yeah. But it's amazing. <laughs> There's something about that, just being on stage yeah. for that amount of time, that allows you to push. Yeah, a lot of push the, through uh, it. I think the performers in um, in musical theatre have got lots of little sayings, and they they call that Doctor Footlights. Yeah, <laughs> Doctor Footlights will take care of yeah. you. Yeah, you go out there and you just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, I, I got a friend who's an opera singer, and uh, he was performing at the Bolshoi in in Moscow, and I went over there to spend wow. some time. And, yeah. and backstage there, I was blown away. Like they've got like doctors backstage, like throat doctors that yeah. you can go to and they'll, it's like a pit stop, you know, yeah, they'll they, do work on you yeah. and then bam, you're fix, back. <laughs> you fix you up on the spot. Yeah. 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 yeah it was, uh, I, I was blown away by the fact that they're on call yeah. just waiting. Yeah. There. Yeah. Sometimes you can get, there are little sort of things that sprays or injections or tablets that might be, you know, they might have steroids in them. So you can't actually use them too much. But right. But you, they'll get but you. Quick fix things. Yeah. They'll, they'll get, get you there. Through. Yeah. 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 And John, I've been mean to say, I, I got to thank you for taking the time out to do this because I know that you're prepping for, you know, you got a big play coming up, and yes, it's um, a play that you you've done before, yeah. and you're bringing it back to the stage. Yeah, this play is, um, it's, yes, I'm 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 prepping before even prior to rehearsal because it's such a it's such a big learn. It's um it's a two man play. It's called The Woman in Black. It's, it, well known in, in the UK for having been running in London for the second longest running play after The Mousetrap. Mm. Uh, I think it was, I think it's finally closed at the Fortune Theatre in Covent Garden, but it was there for like 37 years or something. Wow. And uh, it's a ghost story. Uh, and it's got some moments that are it, like, if you can imagine, you know, you think of a, of a horror movie which has like, you know, pretty scary sort of moments and, um, and they're achieved by cine cinematography and uh, lots of filmic sort of techniques and everything. But in the hands of two actors with no technology whatsoever, but lighting technology and a bit of sound as well, um, you have to create something similar and that, that's what this play does. So um, I, I first did it uh, when I was asked to do it here uh, Rodney Rigby was producing it in 2006, I think it was. Uh, and uh, so I, 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 I found it difficult to work out how to do it from the script. Uh, and I, I, I flew to London using my frequent flyer points for three days. So went yes. to the Fortune Theatre, saw the play, right, right. And, then, and then came back because I had other stuff to do. And I, and I thought... I'm so glad I did that because you know I've, I've, it's a difficult concept to get, but it's two the two actors, a younger man and an older man, are performing a play. It's a little bit, a little bit of a play within a play sort of scenario, mm -hmm. and uh, they're using just the the props that are hanging around an old um, disused theatre, and the audience are you know they describe the 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 two men say we're in an empty theatre here, but actually it's got it's got your audience in it, and. Um, acting out the story and um, it, it, it's up to the actors to create a lot of the atmosphere so it's a really mm. fantastic challenge sure and um, so I'm doing it with Daniel McPherson as the younger actor um, and uh, Daniel's uh, lucky he's back in Australia because he's got a lot of good 
film and TV work happening for himself overseas and in, in the States in particular. Um, so Daniel I, 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 is somebody that, um, I, you know, I, we'd met, but I didn't know him really, really well, but he's great. He's good. Um, I did, I, he was in um, City Homicide, which is a series uh, you know, of the 2000s, and um, I remember meeting him during that time. And uh, yeah, the, the, so there's, it's, it's up to the two of us. He's um, new to the play, and uh, I said, it'd be great if you could see it beforehand. So he has, had, has actually just been to see it. He's in, back in the States, I think, freshening his green card, and uh, right. he went, he, the play was on tour, and it was in Phoenix, Arizona, and he went to see it there. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so he, he's got a heads up on where Yeah, on so, where, you know, you do taken. get an idea from reading the script, but you, you think, how how is this physicalized? How does it work? You know, mm. and you, when you see it done in a theatre, you go, ah, oh, I get it, that's how it works. Right, you know? right. So it's so difficult for a director or anyone else to explain to you how it works. Yeah. I found, anyway, and I think Dan's found the, the same thing. And you're, you're going to be touring it around? Well, at the end of April, uh, we open and we tour, we do Brisbane season, and we tour to Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney. There's a Newcastle, I think, at the Civic as well. So, um, and we'll be at the Theatre Royal in Sydney in, in August. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I'll uh, be there for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to come along. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I just remembered something a while back that I read that you had done. Um, you, in, I think it was late seventies. You'd played mm. Dracula on stage. Yes. Yeah. So, tell me the how the play Dracula, the Bram Stoker story, was turned into a play in the late nineteen twenties. So think. that would have been the role of Bella Lugosi would have played. Yeah. Back then, yeah. Well, it, it's it's it it the play took more or less Bram Stoker's original novel, put it on stage, and it. Uh, it's, I think it was the late twenties that it was performed. It was revived in a Broadway production in the seventies with a, a fabulously stylish production. The whole set was monochrome, black and white. And there were only ever two uh, touches, three touches of red. I think there was a glass of red wine. There was a red rose, and uh, there might have been a little bit of blood somewhere. I can't remember, but uh, it was a very, very stylish thing. And again. Uh, I was invited to go to New York to see it, and uh, Frank Langella, the uh, uh, great American actor, he was yes. playing it on Broadway at the right, time. Right, right. And uh, they had a, I had a beautiful, you know, it was it was Dracula was uh, like he was it was the sexy Dracula, you know, <laughs> right. like the the chicks wanted to be bitten in the neck by this guy right, in, in right. the middle of the night, yeah, <laughs> with his with his big sort of Mister Darcy shirt, you know, and all that. <laughs> uh, so it was fabulous fun. It was very high camp. Uh, melodrama, right, right, and there, so there were. Yeah, but it was, it was also it had its, its, you know, scary moments. It's a great story, sure. And um, God, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was directed by Sir Robert Helpman. Oh, really? Yeah. So I got to work with Bobby. Oh, wow! And that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was, he was, a, he was a fascinating guy. You know, he, he. He wasn't that experienced at directing play. Well, maybe he was. You know, probably he. I know he directed a lot of stuff in his in his life. Um, but he'd. Um, I'd met him uh, just uh, socially, and uh, he'd thought of me when he was casting the thing. So he'd ph phoned my agent and said, "Is John available to play Dracula?" So um, it, it was out of the blue, you know. Like, uh, but he, he wanted a very graceful, uh, beautiful girl to play. Uh, Miss Lucy, the, 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 the heroine. So he got a Lee Rolls, who was an Australian ballet dancer, who had no experience as an actor, but turned out to be very good. And she was this rather gorgeous uh, heroine. Yeah, so it was, um, yeah. It, it was high melodrama, and I was able to camp it up. And I've, sure. um, I've always been happy to have a, a chance to do a bit of overacting, <laughs> to have the license sure, <laughs> to do sure. it, you know. So there's there's uh, a friend of mine who's a great acting teacher, and he said the only thing worse the, than an overactor is an underactor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's so, true. And there's, there's a, a, there's a you know, it depends on your project, and there's a fine, there's a fine line. I, I find that you know, I started out as a young actor, and I was really enamoured of the very minimalist acting style, mm, as mm. most people were in the day, and it sort of suits certain certain things so you know for example like you know the character of uh, Robert McKellar in Rush the Gold Rush series that I did for ABC TV but that he was he was a very contained low-key mm. sort of anti-hero kind of guy 
And also your character of um, Captain Taylor in Brave yes. Moran. Yeah. And I was really impressed Very by that. Internal. There's a lot. This is some of my favorite acting when you yeah. see someone who's there's a lot going on there. Yeah. But the, but seemingly on the surface, it's uh, you ain't showboating it. No. You know. No, and, that's and right. I, I, yeah. I've all, I was always impressed by that role of yours. Yeah. Where it's very. Uh, well, very Bruce, understated, uh, but Bruce Beresford asked me to do that role saying, this is a real character, Captain Taylor. He existed, you know, he's sort of Anglo-Irish person who was in, in British intelligence of the day in the Boer War. And um, uh, he, he's, he had to be a diplomat. He had to walk a fine line. So mm. he had to not give anything away of mm. himself. Really admired Broker, but he was also basically on the other side, even though they were fighting the same war on the same side, you know, there was all these divisions and things between the English and the, and the colonial forces. So mm. yeah, that yeah, was good. Oh. Um, it, it was, it was one of those kinds of roles. And then you get to other things, you know, like I, I, I loved playing, um, playing the, uh, the father in Offspring, Darcy, because mm. he's, he's an outgoing character, you know, and I, uh, I'm, I haven't normally been, chosen or selected to play those kind of roles. So I got the opportunity to just be this sort of out there sort of guy, you know, which is good fun. And did you ever have formal training? Like, uh, like no. Um, was it I followed my dad around when he, when, when I was a kid, my dad was one of those jobbing character actors. He had a lot of um, uh, odd one or two day jobs on movies, British movies of the 1950s. Um, and he knew a lot of people in the industry, you know, as, as the acting community does. They all know each other. And um, even the ones who haven't um, struck sort of a major fame within the industry, they're, they're known. You know? mm. And um, I, 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 uh, I would, I, my godfather is, um, was the late Kenneth Moore, who was a very, very big matinee idol in the UK in the 1950s and 60s. And um, so he, he was like, he was just, you know, my dad's friend. Ken <laughs> and um, I used to uh, hang out with him every every once in a while, particularly when the two of them were doing a movie together, like Reach for the Sky, mm. uh, the Douglas Bader movie. And uh, I I met some fantastic people through my dad, uh, and I watched them work. You know, I, sure. I met Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor at Pinewood Studio. Really? Because my I'm sitting. I was to act like I don't know. It must have been. 12, 13 years old, and they were probably still shooting the never-ending shoot of uh, Cleopatra, I don't know. But this fruity-voiced uh, Welshman came over and uh, said, Rusty, how are you? And uh, and uh, my dad said, oh, <laughs> hello, Dickie, and all that, because they'd done a film together in the 1940s, in Wales, actually, before uh, Richard Burton was famous. And he said, um, have you met Elizabeth? And... and uh, this very small, very beautiful woman uh, was with him, <laughs> and uh, and they they said hello to me, and I just went, I've just been looking at pictures of them in the paper, that yeah, day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so things like that would happen every once in a while in my dad's world, and I just you know, I accepted it. I I, I think it was um it was something of an advantage for me when I started out, uh, you know, in this acting business, the the the. The scenario of being around film sets and in theatres and backstage and everything wasn't anything particularly new to me. It was mm. new for me to be one of the actors doing it, but I knew the the vibe of the thing. You know, I'd grown up with it, sure. so it's a good it's it's a good advantage. You're not completely overawed, and also the example of my dad being someone you know loved and admired as an actor who you know, wasn't rich and famous and uh, so it's not necessarily the way you end up mm. you do it because this is a great thing to do and yes. you're really lucky if you get uh, to be a professional at, at, at something that that is really great to do mm. which it, with music acting performing in general is is just it's it's great if you can have a any kind of a career as a professional sure yeah. sure yeah to be able to uh, yeah yeah to be able to li like especially for your career like yeah. 50 years to have been you know, yeah, <laughs> doing it, it, it's it's phenomenal. It's it, yeah. it, it's a rarity too. There aren't like you know, there there aren't a lot of people that can you know make a life of it. No, you, you sometimes you you just sort of have um, there are people who have a a, a flowering moment in, in a career, and then then it disappears. I, I I you know, it's a business that um, doesn't look uh, kindly upon the aging process, but worse for women than it is for men mm. in that regard. But um, 
you know, I, I just sort of think, well, I'm just going to keep on going and till like Tommy Cooper, I dropped dead on stage. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's, there's, there's worse ways to go. Yeah, yeah. I know. I just <laughs> keep going. Yeah, yeah it is because uh, I, I think it's interesting, like the ageist kind of uh, element that comes into entertainment. For, for me, it's uh, like I've mm. always admired those who have come before, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and no matter what age that they've been at, yeah. like, like, like especially from your generation, like that's... For me, that's where the gold is. You well, know? I learned from um, the, a previous generation of actors, and I learned screen acting in Australia because um, that was where I st started and it's where I've had um, my career. And uh, so recently I, I, um, I went to uh, a memorial uh, for James Davin, the producer, and, um, and a present there was Vincent Ball, uh, a great iconic Australian actor. He went to England and did World War Two movies and things. Mm. And Vincent was in the second series of Rush with me, and he's a hundred years old. Uh, mm. <laughs> he's still going. He was wow. he was turned a hundred last December. It was great to see Vincent there, and uh, and uh, I thought, you know, he is one of the guys that I watched them work and the the older actors. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I watched Anne Hardy and, and Alien Britain was a great Australian actress that uh, I was in a TV thing with, and I just I would I would I learnt by watching them because mm -hmm. I was working with them. I was lucky enough to be, you know, actually engaged with them. Sure, you know. sure. Yeah. And, and and like you said, with with your dad to be able to absorb all of that, you mm. know, from the sidelines uh, yeah. initially too, it's invaluable. Like you yeah. know, you, you see things and you learn things that you're not going to learn in a classroom or in school. Yeah, I saw a lot of plays in the West End, one not a lot, but certainly one or two uh, that my dad was in from a, a, a little chair up in the fly tower, uh, just near the, just inside the proscenium. That's arch. great. Uh, and you just say, oh, "Put the boy up there," you know, yeah. strap him in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's such an impressionable age too to be able to absorb that. Yeah. Like, like for me, when I was younger, going to getting ch chucked out of like the comedy store and comedy clubs for being underage, you know. Yeah, yeah. But then other comedians that knew me sneaking me back in the side to watch and yeah, yeah. you know. But just at that impressionable age, it's it's a very um, it really sets a sets a foundation, I think. So you, so. Get, it's, I mean, seeing people do. I mean, to me, stand up is a, is like the most terrifying high wire act of all time. I and mean, you're out there on your own. And, yeah, you, um, you live and die. On I you. have admiration for you and others who do stand up. You know, I, I I just think it's 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 amazing to actually get through it. You know? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is an interesting. Uh, like, you know, from when I was young, because I wasn't, like, overly outgoing when I was a kid. I, I But I always loved, like, entertaining and doing that kind of stuff. But, yeah. you know, off stage, I was, you know, I was more observant than, than, yeah. than, than rather than being the, in the spotlight the whole time. Probably a, a, a lot of um, stand-up comedians are, are, are like that. They kind of work well when, when they're coming from some sort of visceral place inside them and not reliant upon, you know, interacting with other people. Right, yeah. That's what it is. Well, yeah. Hey, Jerry Seinfeld has some interesting things to say about, you know, the mentality that you need to do what you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a, it is. Um, but just like for me, I feel very fortunate to have, you know, be able to make a living out yeah. of it and to yeah. li live a comfortable life, you know, off of uh, just getting up and telling yeah. jokes yeah. And, uh, and just, <laughs> just connecting with an audience. But, yeah. but I think that's the most important thing, connecting with an audience. Yeah. Whether yeah. It, and, and I see that that's what you do. Every time you're on stage, whether it's, you know, a straight acting yeah. or, or, or like in the, 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 the Onion show or in the Luxembourg show, it's that connection that you have with the audience that makes... It's, it's something... Um, it's something that you, you've either got or you don't have. I mean, I, I don't think... I don't go out there thinking, how can I connect with this audience? I just go out there knowing that I can, mm. uh, you know, mm. in a way. Yeah. And I can, you know, I've, I've, I've done it really well and I've done it not so well. But generally speaking, I know that I can make an audience listen to me. And, I, and um, uh, when the material you're doing is good and most of the things that you get to do in the big professional live theatre... Uh, they're, they're well written things, you know, and you and you and you have great material to work with, uh, and uh, it's a matter of making it your own, mm. and always just feeling that inclusion of the people who are who are out there. I don't necessarily, um, you know, want lights to be on the audience to actually eyeball them, but I know that I feel them. They're a living, breathing yes. animal. Yes. And uh, and they're they're a part of my environment i go out and uh, onto the stage in the in the hour leading up to uh 
curtain of a, of a show, you know, when it's empty. And I like mm. to go out there and just, uh, I just stand in the middle of the stage and, and think, actually, this is my home. This is where I belong. Mm. You know, not, I'm terrified of this. You know, you can, you can, you can, you can scare yourself, so on, but you just got to realize, actually, it is your home because mm. it's where you, when it takes off, it's where you you yourself you know kind of um, take off and fly, uh, and it's it gives me that that feeling that nothing else in life does. People say, "Oh, do you know, have you ever done bungee jumping?" I say, "Look, I I stand on stage in front of two thousand people. I don't need to terrify <laughs> myself in any other way. <laughs> I don't need extreme sports yeah, yeah, to yeah. get my adrenaline going." Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting you talk about the. Um, you know, connecting with an audience and, and someone who never connected with an audience in terms of in a live uh, <laughs> context was the person that you uh, picked uh, for your favourite album. Yeah, which Harry is, Nielsen. Yeah, here he is, Nielsen Sings Newman. This is, uh, you know, you asked me about, um, you know, favourite albums and the books and movies. And of course, like, like many other people, I, there are things that I love and things that I don't. And I, and I basically... So I thought of things that just, you know, things that are among the things that I like the sure, most. Sure, sure. And this, uh, and, and it's usually it's because they've, they've just had a lasting effect. They never go out of my affections. And um, this album I fell in love with in 1971, whenever it came out. I already liked um, uh, Harry Nilsson, um, you know, I liked his... Uh, Schmilson in the night and uh, his reworking of, uh, of uh, old sort of swing classics and um, uh, so I was I was um, listening to this album when I was about to go on to uh, to do a, a, a musical show called uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona a rock op rock opera and I remember I learned all the music for that show and this was my comfort music that I learned on the side you know right. just to, uh, this is what, what I listened to and and um, it's a beautiful album. Uh, Done in all in studio on his own, basically by Harry Nilsson, mm. doing the the songs of his friend and fellow piano playing composer <laughs> Randy Newman. And um, years later, in the late eighties, um, I was asked by John English to uh, sing a role on his recording of his rock opera Paris, which is about the Trojan Wars, not about the city in France, and. Um, uh, he, I got this phone call from from John, who was a very close friend of mine, and um, he said, "Hey, John, I want to. I've got two two things I want to do." He said, "I want to get you back singing again, and I want to get Doc Neeson acting." So <laughs> <laughs> there was a kind of singing slash acting thing going on in this recording, and uh, one of the I said, "Yeah, well, I'll do it." I played Agamemnon, the King of the Greeks, and. Uh, uh, Doc Neeson was there and Trevor White and all of John's friends. We were all in it. It was a brilliant recording. Mm. And I can recommend anybody go to Spotify and, and listen to uh, John English's double album, Paris, the rock opera. And it's, it really is a fantastic, it, it's hugely expensively made, uh, produced by John's um, uh, co-author, Dave Mackay, an Australian who, who lives and works in the UK mostly. He's been a producer for... Um, um, Bonnie Tyler, among other people. Oh, right, right. And when I arrived, I found out that um, playing the role of Ulysses in this production was Harry Nilsson. And of course, I was like, I love Harry wow. Nilsson. I'm going to get to work with Harry Nilsson. So we uh, had a, a, a big sort of uh, publicity launch. And um, I met Harry on the night before at a sort of social gathering and then we went to the Sydney Opera House for this launch of we're going to record this album which is a precursor to performing a, a live show of this rock opera uh, and uh, and I just you know I hit it off really well with uh, Harry who was one of my um, heroes really uh, of the recording world and um, so I got a, a lot of his his what made him tick firsthand from him. And he did say that uh, among, the th among, among the many things he, he told me was that um, he uh, was just too uptight and nervous to perform live. He wanted to be a studio re recording artist. Right. Or, and that's what he did was he never performed. He, I think he said there was a couple of things I did that was just kind of like a TV studio audience, but 
I just never did tours or, or work live. It's, it's amazing that someone can have, like, release that yeah. great music and have the career so much that he had talent. without, you know, yeah. with no touring. Yeah. Yeah. It's... And um, these songs, these songs are beautiful renditions of Randy Newman songs. Randy Newman songs are brilliant anyway. And Harry, of course, has put his own little thing on mm. his, his own beautiful, pure high, mm. high voice, which, um, you know, when he was working with us on the Paris album, I found myself in the, in the recording studio singing duet with Harry Nilsson. I thought, you know, it's okay now, I can die. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, this is, this is fantastic. And he really was, uh, his voice wasn't as pure as it had been. And um, he was somebody who um, gave himself a bit of thrashing in, in, mm. in life, you mm. know, with the booze and stuff like that. But um, he was a beautiful man. And um, he, 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 stu he still sang brilliantly. Mm. And he asked me, he said, you know, John, they were told me about, you know, all the things you've done as an actor. And he said, I want to, you know, if you've got any advice for me about characterization, he said, I'm just a singer. And I, I thought... <laughs> Now this, 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 something's wrong with this picture. <laughs> I idolise this man, and he's asking me for advice. You know? yeah. That's uh, the kind of guy that uh, that he turned out to be when I met him. You know, it's great when people say don't meet your heroes, but uh, it can be really good. Sure, yeah. sure, yeah. yeah. And and someone like he seemed to be someone who would have those sensibilities too to not yeah. you know not be a you know a prima donna or yeah. A, yeah. And he and he and he, <laughs> you know, he would. He repeated, uh, he said, I've told this, I've had to tell people this a lot, but he said, no, I didn't write Everybody's Talking for Midnight Cowboy. Right. It was written by a, a friend of mine called Fred Neal. Mm. And he said, but we, they were asking, the movie uh, producers were asking for submissions for songs for the movie. And he said, I sent in um, my song, a demo of my song, I Guess the Lord Must Be in New York City. I don't know if you know that song. It's a beautiful song that, that Harry wrote. Right. So tired of going nowhere, da, 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 I'll be on my way. Guess the Lord must be New York City. And I had this little vibe that was quite similar to the everyone's, Everybody's Talking song. And the producers said, oh, we like Fred's song, Everybody's Talking, but we like your vocal, so we'd like you to sing Fred's song. And that's how it, uh, right, how it came right. about, because it was a... Uh, his first really big hit yeah, single, the putting, I yeah, yeah. I, I always remember I had the soundtrack to Reservoir Dogs, oh, yeah. and it had had the song um, "Put the Lime in the Coconut." Oh, you put the lime yeah, in the, the coconut, coconut. <laughs> yeah, put them both together. It's <laughs> <I said>, doctor. <laughs> There's something I can do. Yeah. yeah, and it was um, and that song always stood out in my mind yeah. off of that album because I listened to that album like I had the CD and I just listened to it a yeah, lot when yeah. I was young, a teenager. And I always remember that Harry Nelson, that was a song that always stood out. And of course, the um, from Midnight Cowboy, from yeah, yeah, Everybody's yeah, Talking. Yeah. But then, you know, like um, hearing his renditions on this thing mm. and his harmonizations oh, are just beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Like, you, you hear what you think are female backing vocals, and it's actually Harry with his high voice doing all the harmonies right, right. together. Yeah. Uh, that and song, um, is it um, Living Without You? Yeah. Yeah, that's so tired. <laughs> Living Without You. Yeah. Um, because Randy Newman's songs are uh, kind of unique in their structure and, mm. and um, they're, they're, the chords that Randy Newman uses on the piano and that he uses when he does his string orchestrations are really bluesy, discordant sort of mm. chords. Mm. And Harry's got that, but he's also... Um, He's he's kind of uh, made little stories out of some of the songs. Mm. You know, there's a, I think it's the first track. Uh, That's a tape that we made, but it's about a garage band who never made it. But <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a you know you hear the Randy Newman originals of um, some of these songs, and you and then you hear what Harry's done with them, and he's it. He's he's geez, he's been faithful to the songs, but he hasn't slavishly copied them, and he's done right. them all, and he's. His, in his way, like I'll Be Home, the song I'll Be Home, mm. um, which is um, when Randy Newman sings it, it's, it's, a, it's a different key. It's, uh, mm. uh, it's, it's a very beautiful bluesy ballad. Uh, when Harry does it, it's, it's in this ethereal place that only Harry could take a mm. song. And um, I've passed the love of this album on to all my children, my, my uh, my oldest son Ivan, who's 
51, I think, this year. Uh, he, he's a, he's a singer-songwriter, and um, it, it, this is one of his favourite albums of all time. Oh, great. And similarly, now with uh, Archie and Rusty, they both uh, listen to this album and really love it. So, yeah, it's an, on, it's an enduring thing, and that's why I think it's really... Uh, there's so many albums that I love in life, of course. Sure, you know. of course. Um, and, and so many that are, uh, you know, are life-changing in many ways. Um, the, uh, the Beatles' White Album, mm. I, it, interestingly enough, I, I, I first heard that. It was, uh, I, I told you about doing the movie with Bo Bridges. Well, Bo and I got, you know, to be quite pally through love of music and things. And mm. he said, oh, I got this tape of the, the new Beatles record. And it wasn't out in Australia at the time. It was, um, it was the White Album, but it had been transferred onto quarter-inch tape and sent to him in a box by his young brother, Jeff, who was, <laughs> would have been 17 or 18 at the time. You're right. And so I listened to all the... Because Jeff wanted to put all his comments. Oh, you know, listen to this next one. Back in the US, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a Beach Boys thing, but it's just really, it's really cool, man. And he, he does his own little introduction to all Dude, of the oh, songs. Fantastic. And then that, And that's how... I listened to the White Album for the very first time, introduced by Jeff, Jeff Bridges. Bridges. <laughs> that's fantastic. In, in Bo Bridges' rented house in Nowra. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, weird. Yeah, it, but, it, but it's interesting that, that you make, that you're talking about the Beatles because um, mm. Lennon uh, Nilsson was one of Lennon's yes. favourite musicians. Too. Yeah, so you know they they obviously hit it off really well, and particularly um, you know what John Lennon called his lost weekend is the mm. time when he left Yoko and went. And hung out with Harry Nilsson and others, and Keith Moon and all the bad boys in uh, Los Angeles. Mm. Um, and uh, Harry said to me, uh, you know, John was, you know, of course he was an incredible guy. He was, um, he was able to hold and and function with any drugs in his system you care and name except alcohol. He said he was a goddamn horrible drunk. Mm, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So the. the um, you know, he would get, he would just turn kind of nasty and abusive when he was drunk, which is, you know, should have just stuck with the psychedelics and he'd have been okay. Yeah, sure. It would have been all peace, yeah. love, all yeah. you need. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he's, he said, well, when you knew John, when he got to that drunken stage, you know, you just want to think, how can I get him home now? Yeah, you know, sure. So, yeah, yeah, get yeah. the car keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, uh, but to, to have been around during, like, you know, just to have spent time with, with, with like, for him to have spent mm. time with John Lennon, you know, and, 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 and there'd be such a mutual admiration there because, yeah. like, Nielsen did that song. What was it? Um, um, oh, there was a song that I remember listening to it years ago thinking, I don't remember hearing this Beatles song. But then I realised every beat, like, there were titles and lyrics from Beatles songs oh, within it. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You Can't Do That? Was, yeah, that, was that the yeah. name of the song that he did? Well, that was a Beatles song. Yeah, but yeah. did he call it You oh, Can't you Do That? Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. he did, yeah. And it was, and it was just all, yeah, because I, I remember well, that, he, being yeah. confused the first time I heard it. Because Harry was that age. He was hugely influenced by, by the Beatles, as, you know, the whole world was influenced by the Beatles. But yeah. um, if you were someone like Harry and you got to be a very, very big uh, recording star, then then you get you get to meet and become friends with um, these people. And they, they have this uh, community. Where people often say, why do the, um, you know, big stars, why do they always hang out with each other? And you say, well, look, they're in the same business. Mm. If they just go schlepping around you know, out there, of course they've got their families and things, but, you know, it's very hard for, for big, big celebrities to know who is their friend and who isn't, yeah. who wants a piece of them, who right. wants to hang on their coattails or whatever. But when Paul McCartney and Mick Jagger are together, they're the same. Yes. You know, so they can really relax. Sure, And that's sure. why people do hang out together, you know. And, and they get each other too. Yeah, they get you it. Know, they, they know the, the stresses. They know yes. the downsides. Um, they can understand what life is, you know, like at their uh, at their um, elevated height of the profession. Sure, sure, and, and also they've been in the trenches together. Yeah, you know, they know the yeah, yeah they know yeah, the yeah. landscape. Yeah, yeah. Usually, they've usually, you know, I I I saw the Rolling Stones at the Crawdaddy at uh, the Bridge Hotel in Richmond. Uh, you know, before they were famous. Well, they they just started. I think they must have. Um, 
I want to be your man had probably just been released. But oh, they'd right. been a, a blues band yeah. you know, around for a year or two. But the Beatles gave them. Too. Yeah, yeah. They gave them, they <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you saw them, like, for the first, like, yeah. were you like, these guys, oh, that, yeah. they're they were, it? They were magic. They were magic. So, so too were the Yardbirds and, and so too were the Small Faces. Yeah. But yeah. Stevie Marriott was just unbelievable. He just, he's just a little guy. They were all sm they were all small actually, but Stevie Marriott just lit the room up. He was like rock and roll persona. Yeah, 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 he was brilliant. Did you ever see um, Randy Newman live? I did. I saw um, Randy Newman um, performing a concert at the Capitol Theatre in Sydney in the eighties, sometime, and it was um, just him and a grand piano. And he walked out oh. on stage. Uh, in a t-shirt and a pair of sneakers, <laughs> didn't talk much, sat down at the piano and started playing through his catalogue of songs, you know. And when, when you listen to some of his recordings where they've got these beautiful lush arrangements, he, 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 you know, he, he manages to evoke that when it's just him and a piano. Like mm. he did Sail Away and you could hear mm. those string lines from mm. that beautiful song. We will cross the mighty ocean to Charleston Bay. And you listen to that s song Sail Away when you realise it's about slave boats taking Africans from mm. West Africa mm. in chains, you know. In America, if a man is free. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. To take care of his home and his family. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah. Speaking of that, you're connected... Uh, Within that song, your ancestry connection. Yes. Well, yeah, the cross Atlantic the slave trade. Um, yeah, my. But uh, from the opposite angle. Yeah, from, yeah. <laughs> luckily, you know, I did. I I, I found out a lot about my mum's uh, family. My mum, I knew, was from a white West Indian family. Um, she was born in in um, Dominica, in the the West Indies. Lived in Saint Lucia, where she grew up, and her her mother and her mother's antecedents had been there for a few generations. And when I did the Who Do You Think You Are show, they. Uh, Took me over to the Caribbean, and I, um, and I, and I, I thought, now who's this this uh, Baines fellow? This Edmund Baines. He came, went there in 1834. I hope to Christ he wasn't a slave trader or a, or a or a plantation owner. And it turns out that he was um, a public servant who's um, given a job as a stipendiary magistrate to help the enslaved people in the transition to freedom because the uh, Emancipation Act was came out in 1834, and that's when he arrived. Arrived in Jamaica and um, was later went to the um, Eastern Caribbean, and he worked as an administrator on the transition. So he was on the good side of the ledger. He tried to do a good job, and um, the planters tried to have him killed because he's, he was doing his job too well. They wanted yeah. a yes man, and the colonial government were on the planters' side. You know, mm. so the colonial government had their headquarters, I think, um, in, in Antigua in the day, and. Um, they uh, they thought oh god we've hired this Edmund Baines character and he's he's doing it all right we just want someone to go through the motions yeah you know? just tick because, the boxes yeah, for yeah. us yeah because the 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 planters were given huge financial compensation for the abolition of slavery but they wanted to keep the slaves as well you right know, like, like come on yeah <laughs> but it was great it, and it shows like you know the 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 ethics you know yeah. uh, of him during that time because in that time I wasn't socially accepted to say, call no. it out and say, hang on, this is wrong. So No, it's, it's, it's quite often, you know, it's a def defense of um, slave trading and the whole, uh, you know, the whole obscene business of slavery that, um, oh, well, it was that era. But there were people in that era sure. who knew that this was a filthy, evil thing. Sure. And so it's not really... A big excuse. It was like if there was money to be made, oh, enslaved, you know, you know well, well, it doesn't affect us, you know. But, but your your relative Baines, like yeah. he put his job on the line he, he, in he, order yeah. to do the ethical thing. Yes, you know, or yeah. Was it, or yeah. was it like he had something to lose? So I yeah, he had nothing to gain. He was poorly paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, that was that was a relief, and I, and I spoke to. Um, Caribbean uh, historians and archivists uh, who said, oh, he's got a good place in, in the records. And you found out about this on camera? On camera, yeah. So, so, so when you're sitting down, you're looking at him pulling out the papers yeah. and the files That's thinking... A, it's like you I, and me now. And yeah. I'm saying, now here, and I read out this document that said they, they in, in Antigua, um, they, they raped his 13-year-old daughter, one of, the, one of the soldiers attached to the planters, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
were, it, as an act of violence against him and his family mm. because he was trying to help the process of freedom for the slaves. And I, I, I read that, I went, this is, this is horrifying. You know, he, they were acquitted, mm. of course. The people responsible for the rape were, were acquitted by the colonial government sort of quick trial. Yeah. So the personal toll that that took on his oh, life to... Yeah, yeah. And he'd lost... He had eight children and um, four, four of them died of tropical diseases. So, you know, uh, it happened to a lot of people at, in, in that era. Mm. Um, but it was, it was an incredible experience to be on that show. And the, the, the researching that they do is brilliantly done. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but to but to know you know that those who had come before you know yeah. in your family bloodline had yeah you know, yeah it's good. I mean, had, look, had, had they been a planter family, had they owned slaves, would have been a horrible thought. But um, you, you, I would have had to live with it. You yeah, know? Uh, <laughs> it would have been a horrible thought. But uh, you know, it's kind of like you think, ah, well, there was humanitarianism in my antecedents genes that are <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that was a long time yeah, yeah, ago. Yeah, come on, yeah, people, yeah, we're moving yeah, on from on. this. <laughs> but he was also an aspiring poet, too. Yeah. He had artistic sensibilities. So from your mother's side, bloodline, yes. and from your father's bloodline, you had that yeah. consistent, creative... Well, my um, mum was a dancer. My dad was um, an actor. They met at, uh, I think, Birmingham Rep before the Second World War. Mm. Um, and uh, my mum and, my mum had um, uh, five children, so... Um, you know, she uh, she slaved she slaved away with <laughs> five unruly children yeah. while he went out on his occasional acting work um, because you know it was tough as a jobbing character actor to constantly stay in work. Sure, uh, sure. And uh, but it was a, it was a, an interesting life to be among the poorest of my friends at school, and yet I had a father who could ad lib in iambic pentameter and mm. was you know hanging been, out. To Glasgow University and yeah. uh, hanging out with Richard Burton yeah, and, yeah, and Liz Taylor, I know. <laughs> but all my all my mates, they you know they, I was sometimes you know given a tin of Heinz baked beans for dinner because my mum you know, despite the tears it caused her was, was all she could afford to give us. Oh. But uh, you know all my mates had their televisions and their brand new fridges all on the, all all on the never never you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, my parents were were. A very well educated and literate people, but they didn't have steady work. Mm. Uh, my dad, mm. in particular, so you know he made it. He made a choice, and um, I'm glad he did because you know he was he was he was a happy man for doing what he did. Sure, uh, sure, yeah. There, there is that, like you know, if he had taken the straight and narrow job where you know a nine yeah. to five existence. You know that would have eaten away at him. I'm sure, yeah, not yeah. knowing like what could have been. Like you know, he was also a very egalitarian person, and I'm glad that I had him as an influence instead of you know some some kids my age didn't have parents who understood. You know, like in England was going through. It's a big issue now, immigration. But England was going through huge uh, immigration, particularly from the Caribbean in the 50s. Mm. And um, I remember my dad's. You know, I lived in a very very sort of white bread suburb. Teddington in southwest London, and my dad was saying, "I oh, know there's a West Indian family have moved in down the road." He said, "I, I think, I think we should, you know, maybe call around and and um, and, and ask them how they're going and uh, introduce ourselves." And and uh, and then he thought about, it. he thought, but maybe that's not right. You know, maybe that's treating them as different, and they don't want to be treated as different. They want mm. to be treated as, as the same. You know, he he had the intelligence to think everything through. See it from you know, both his angles. His feelings were yeah. all of the right. Uh, came from the right place, but mm. he, he had you know just had the, the, the smartness to think everything for you mm. through, and you know, don't be a, an inverse racist, you know, mm. by your pattern of behaviour or whatever. Mm. Yeah. But it would have been great, you know, for you know for those qualities to, yeah. to have grown up around those qualities and yeah. have that instilled Look, in you, like from we, you know, so many people get there. I mean, we all we all take something from our parents, don't we? And um, sure. and we're lucky if we've had. Good people, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of people that um, are, two are actors <laughs> and have uh, left a, a mark on uh, you know many yeah. people's lives. <laughs> uh, your favorite selection of uh, the movie? Of film. Well, the movie. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm thinking of movies that, of course, I, I'm an admirer of some of the great you know classic directors and so on. Sure, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, currently I really, I'm, I'm sort of 
almost obsessed with Wes Anderson movies. Oh, They're yeah. so incredible. Uh, his, you know, the composition of his frames and everything sure. like that. And just those little moments that yeah. I'm like, it, it, uh, there's one, I remember the, one of the first, well, Bottle Rocket was, was yeah. great, the first one, but seeing it in the cinema, the first Wes Anderson film I saw was um, Rushmore. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and Bill Murray's delivery oh. in that is just like pitch yeah. perfect. And just like, <laughs> when he's just driving in the car and, he, and his son says some little smart ass comment to him the twins and then one of them says yeah blow it out your ass dad and he pauses for a moment and then just yeah, yeah, as he's yeah. driving like <laughs> with his arm trying to reprimand uh, him from the front seat it's uh there's, it, there, there. so there's the, there's these guys that are you know they're like modern movie makers you know scorsese i love yes and um but i thought of a movie that um i just loved from childhood and i've always loved mm -hmm. and i've introduced it to um, a, a younger generation, current day. It's, it's not. It's, it's uh, it shows its age in its pacing, but its its comedic brilliance is because of Danny Kaye mm -hmm. and some great writings. The Court Jester, and uh, it's shot in Technicolor. I love Technicolor. Mm. So I vibrant. wish they still made movies in Technicolor. It's, yeah, the color is larger than life, but it's it's it's, you know, it's perfect for a. A kind of spoof on medieval history made by <laughs> Americans and you know set in England but it has the, the the luminous lovely Glynis Johns and and it's 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 notable for a comedic tour de force from from Danny Kay but the 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 fast wordplay and uh, a lot of people know it for the um, the poisoning scene where the <laughs> pellet with the poisons in the flagon with the dragon and the chalice from the palace is the brew that is true. <laughs> <laughs> nice, you got that down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the vessel with the pestle. Oh, yes. And then the palace with the chalice gets broken. So they have to change. Oh, no, there's now a flagon and it's got a dragon on the, fl oh, the, so the flagon with the dragon. And where's the pellet with the poison and the vessel with the pestle? No, it's in the flagon with the dragon. And <laughs> I love that scene when it's just so, uh, there's so much going on and then at the end, uh, it's just like thrown to the wayside when the king's like, look, forget about that. Yes, you know, there won't be any toast. Yeah, we move were, on, you know. Yes. It's like, oh, yeah, went yeah. through all of that. <laughs> and he's been in his magnetised uh, suit oh, of armour. Yes, 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 struck lightning. by lightning. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and there's a scene that precedes that where he wants to, he wants to become a knight so that he can fight the bad guy. Uh, mm. And um, he it, it has an initiation ceremony to become a knight, and it's taking too long, so they speed it up. Yay, verily, yay! And eventually, they they carry him around, and on and the, the drums go. Dum, 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 yay, verily, yay! <laughs> Get through this, come on! Yeah, yeah. And uh, Basil Rathbone, of course, is the um, the baddie, um, and they have this incredible sword fight where the the um, the magical woman, sort of witch type, her. Puts his spell on him that makes him an expert. Put on Danny Kaye's yes. character to make him an expert sword. sword All sword. he has to do is click his fingers. <laughs> but if he clicks his fingers again, he goes back that. to what he was. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's. Yeah. Yeah. Ha ha! I can beat you any time, just like that. <laughs> 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 but it's great, like it's brilliantly done, and that's not easy. Like that style of comedy that he does, it's like a Jim Carrey or something. Like yes. people, people will ah oh, flippantly or Jerry Lewis flippantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that st heightened style of comedy is very difficult to it, pull off. He really does pull it off for me. Yes, I think Jim Carrey. I'm a huge admirer of what Jim Carrey does. I mean, I think that you know the mask and like they're just masterpieces. Even Grinch. Yeah, his Grinch is unbelievable. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, Jerry Lewis, nah, he didn't quite win me over. Yeah, yeah. Because his, just, his face was pulled It was too much. Yeah, but Danny Kay was an expert at but that it, style of... of yes, yeah. just pitch perfect. Yeah, yeah. Like, he, he's a very... Uh, I remember um, reading a, a biography. Well, it's, kind of, it's an autobiography, but he had a ghostwriter with it, but it was released after he passed of um, George Carlin, who's one of yeah. my favourite comedians. And how he... Danny Kaye was his hero when he was a kid yeah. and he wanted to be Danny Kaye when, <laughs> and that's why he got involved in film and like, initially aspired yeah. to be in film when he was younger but then he figured out oh, I'm not that great of an actor well, you know, yeah. but Danny Kaye was like his touchstone like, and he, he was, was Danny Kaye was an actor and his main thing was comedic acting in movies mm. he was in some ways a bit of a children's entertainer with his Hans Christian Andersen um, stuff and uh, when I was um, quite small in the in the fifties, I listened to a, uh, 
Uncle Mac's children's favourites on BBC Radio, and they would they would often feature Denny Kaye singing uh, the the Ugly Duckling or Thumbelina, mm. and um, and all of my other childhood favourites, including my my favourite singing cowboys, Roy Rogers and Gene Autry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah the, 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 but there was something about those entertainers from that generation that had done like the vaudevillian circuit, mm. or done like uh, I know that Danny Kay had done like the Catskills, and uh, yeah. and when they bring it to screen, it's like whoa, they're a powerhouse. Yeah. They're, there's a yeah, real. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they've got so many runs on the board that it's like just let the cameras roll, let them yeah. do their thing. And if you have if you have that skill and that innate sense of timing then uh it doesn't matter how huge you are in your performance like with jim carrey i mean he could he could just do anything and he gets away because he is so fully committed and mm. that's the thing you it, you know you have to be as long as you whatever you're doing if you're doing like big acting it has to come from a real place yeah. inside you yeah. and when it when it originates from a real place it can never fail mm. you, know? you you can never go oh i don't believe that no no yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, it's and there's a real depth like especially like with jim carrey's acting i, I find, like he there's a real depth to it oh, you yeah, know? yeah and there's a and there's a pain there as well underneath yeah. you can really yeah i think you have capable of having the pathos. With Danny Kaye was the same he had the pathos the, the secret life of walter mitty was mm. a really fabulous danny mm. Kaye movie um, so uh, yeah, that was my that was my movie choice. Although, you know, uh, among the contenders uh, yeah. would have been uh, Doctor Strange Love, or <laughs> yeah, Sellers, <laughs> which I just yeah. think is uh, yeah brilliant. Uh, yeah, or I guess you know because of because of Peter Sellers, because of Stanley Kubrick, because of mm. a number of reasons. Yeah, uh, and um, uh, yeah, the the, uh, the <laughs> all of those men and. <laughs> In the in the Pentagon and um, the president saying, "Gentlemen, this is the war room. You can't fight in the war room." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's um. Well, Sellers was another one too that could just play those ro those roles just pitch perfect. Yeah, like he, yeah. he he knew just yeah. how to how to land it. And the physical comedy, great too. Yeah. Like yeah. you look at his work in the party, or 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 just the way that he held himself in being there too, where it yeah. was very contained, but oh, that was physical. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, and he also he was he could he could get as outrageous as he needed to be as Inspector Cluzo, right? But he didn't lose you because of that thing of it came from a real place. You yes, know? That, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Are there any other contenders that you have for? Because because I was well, interested to wait, yeah. to hear what your uh, well, what, you know, what your favourites would be. Um, I, I grew up loving cowboy movies, uh, and um, I I liked uh, Rio Bravo, mm. John Wayne. That's mm. a fantastic cowboy movie. It's uh, you know it's the it's the ultimate sort of have to clean up the bad guys from the town sort of story. And um, Dean Martin is a drunken gunslinger. Uh, Ricky Nelson, a pop star, yeah. just put into the movie because he was a handsome teen idol. Mm. But he but he. You know, he pulls off being the young kid gunslinger pretty well, mm. and uh, and John Wayne, and um, uh, yeah, it, 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 Angie Dickinson is in it, and there's a there's a a relationship between John Wayne, the main cowboy hero, and a woman, and that was kind of breaks the rules of westerns. Westerns mm. don't have smoochy love; they don't. Mm. They're not. Mm. You know, the cowboys uh, tip their hats to the hookers and say ma'am yeah and, <laughs> <laughs> and off onto the sunset yeah yeah, yeah. but uh it, it broke those rules and somehow got away with it yeah which yeah is, which was good yeah. uh, it's funny talking of um cowboys i went to um my my wife's from the u.s and her yeah. mum lives in arizona and we've taken a few road trips out to um tombstone yeah and just walking through tombstone like the same like they haven't really touched the town from when it was when Doc Holliday and Wyatt <laughs> yeah. were there, and it's the like, OK Corral is still standing. In. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's like you're literally walking through history, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and yeah, you get the guys walking around with the you, uh, you know spurs on, and yeah. the, but it, but it, you got the carriage going down the main street, and it's yeah. like, it does take you back to that, that yeah, yeah. time. It's a, yeah, I like. I haven't done a real sort of like um, Wild West tour of the states. So I should go and. Uh, Check a few of those places out. Yeah, I still I, I'm st I'm I'm a lover of westerns. Um, I like the uh, the Clint Eastwood series, yeah. uh, the, the Sergio Leone ones. 
Yeah, um, yeah, masterfully shot. Yeah, and yeah. And, and, the, and with the um, Marconi uh, yeah. soundtracks to and you, Yeah, yeah. 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 I, yeah. I remember he was playing. He was in um, one year when I was doing the Adelaide Fringe, and he was performing there really? at, in, at, at the zoo. Big uh, outdoor concert. Oh, uh, we're conducting an orchestra. Yeah, yeah. Orchestra. yeah. And and this just goes to show how ridiculous they are in organising stuff in that town. Like even like when you do the Adelaide Fringe, you're in the big garden area. Yeah. And you perform like in tents. Yeah. But then they'll put like, uh, you know, a drumming band next to you. So you're trying to do stand up, and you got this <laughs> like throughout, the, and, and the, the the whole stage yeah, is yeah, shaking, yeah. and you go. Did did anyone think when organising the, the you know this festival the timing been, of gigs here? Being careful and, not to do the park stuff in the end. <laughs> yeah, it's um it can be challenging. Yeah, 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 and yeah. um and that yeah. year they um they so they put um uh, Marconi on in the doing the out outdoor concert. Yeah. All these great scores. But they have the damn Calypso 500 race on. Uh, so you hear this <laughs> in the and background. He's to make, and, yeah, bom, bom, yeah. Bom. <laughs> and I just thought, man, he must have thought, I've traveled all the way to Australia for this. What am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, um, yeah, I, I think that was one of the last times he performed out here. So I, yeah. I, I, I love the cowboy. Uh, cowboy songs, you know, like the old, mm. um, the old-fashioned harmony, Riders of the Sage, yeah, I've got one, <laughs> I've got one, I have an album of songs called Cloudland, and there's, there's one called Rusty the Cowboy, which is written about my son Rusty when he was a little baby, he was such a benign little little baby. I thought he was he he's the peaceful cowboy nice. who never draws a gun, <laughs> and so I did Rusty the Cowboy in in that kind of style <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, that's great there's a, and there's something um transportive about watching those old west yeah, too. yeah. Uh, i also like the big epic uh the alamo which is a fantastic yes. epic again yeah. it's john wayne but um yeah it's got uh lots and lots of uh, lawrence harvey the great english star who played the uh colonel travis the uh, leader of the of the defenders of the fort and um yeah, Jim Bowie, Davy Crockett, all these characters are yeah, in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I always loved um, the one with Montgomery Clift, Red River. Yeah, yeah. and and how it showed John Wayne in a different dynamic too, yeah, with the yeah. younger guy coming up. Then and apparently, um, because yeah, I, I love uh, Montgomery Clift's work, I was reading this uh, biography on him and talking about the animosity between John Wayne behind the scenes. Yeah, he's like he's like who's this upstart kid? Because yeah, you know yeah. Monty was very much of a new sort of style of acting too yeah he was one he was he was the yeah the the new trend really wasn't he yeah, you know, really, yeah and really but but it worked really on camera change. though yeah between yeah. the two of them to see that right. animosity yeah yeah yeah, you know, yeah between the two come through so that acting that i was referring to earlier in our conversation about being low key you know james dean was kind of like really personified that mm. as well mm. yeah. and those actors that came through in the 1950s yeah and brando too he could yeah, really yeah, have those yeah. oh, steel well. moments of just yeah yeah uh, but, but you know there were some actors in earlier eras who had a bit of it. ronald coleman uh, the english actor of the 30s and 40s he 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 was in the the, the first I don't know if it's the first movie made of a movie made of um, a tale of two cities. There's right. a famous version with Dirk Bogard, but uh, the one with Ronald Coleman. You, you watch him there, and you see it's kind of modern style of acting. Mm, you know, mm. uh, it's 30s or 40s. I can't remember the, quite the, exactly when it was made, but it's definitely before its time. Right, right. I have to yeah. take a look at that. Yeah, yeah. I always find that the, a lot of those guys, you know, and, and women, they just had the like with those old films like the old hollywood films like they the, the acting was exceptional yeah, you know like yeah. it's really like they, they you know of course you got the over the top kind of cagney kind of yeah, yeah, yeah but it still know. has to but, be but within the, but within the context of that it's still yeah, it still yeah, really it works really good yeah you know watch um some of the um Cary grant uh, oh, yeah. romantic comedies of the 30s you know Great. my first my, wife yeah my girl friday my, yeah yeah yeah, yeah that, it's that's just beautiful beautiful scripting lots and lots of we're bringing up baby where Catherine hepburn has a stream of consciousness dialogue yes. throughout almost the whole movie yeah and and Cary grant's the the nerdy paleontologist <laughs> right right <laughs> which is 
so way removed from the Cary. He just, you know, Cary Grant played Gary Cary Grant, but he did it really well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, and there is like like Bogart, you know, watching him, yeah. like you know, Maltese Falcon, or you know, yeah, yeah it's Bogart, but pitch perfect. You yeah, know? it was always perfect in everything. He, he, I'll, I'll, I'll make this character a Bogart character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but even the other like Green Street, you know, the other actors yeah, too yeah, that yeah. were like, you know, they, they were perfect for that role. You've got, you've got the characters. Uh, who who work in and around the big stars? I, it would have been an incredible time. Like when there was a big big star system in, mm. in Hollywood, and the and, you know from the start of talkies onwards, and it became this huge great you know real system. It would have been. It's not realistic in today's world to run things like that because you can't you can't you know you can't have people being fantasy figures. They're big, Actors are real, real people now. Right, uh, right. But back yeah. then, they they weren't. <laughs> yeah, but I, I I I like it to not knowing too much about an actor as yeah. well. You yeah. know, it's like the and you see certain like you know like like a Daniel Day Lewis like you know there's not a lot that we then we yeah we know he was a cobbler and but he a, kept himself quiet as it's as far as his personal life. Yeah, and I think he did that. It seems to me that he did it deliber deliberately as a way of being able to present each new character that he played as someone that doesn't come with the baggage of knowing Daniel Day-Lewis. Right, right. And I think that's a sensible kind of thing to do. Sure. And I think there's others, you know, Ray Fiennes is a little bit like that as well, stays away at, at, from the limelight. Yeah. Um, and, uh, although I remember on the plane. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was with the hostess on the plane. I remember that was like big uh, news for a while. Oh, there is, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah, but yeah, someone like that, yeah, you don't know much about. And someone's her, whose work I just loved was um, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, like and and he and his broad range of, of characters too, where he could yeah. play this down and out, just sad loser of a character. Yeah. But then he could also play like a menacing. Yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. You know, um, like he had this broad range. He did this um, range of, sort of L. Ron Hubbard thing in the movie with right, Christian Yeah, Bale. the master. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and, but then he was in like Mission Impossible 3 or something where yeah. he's sitting across Tom Cruise playing this just frightening character, just yeah. so minimal. Like, I uh, think that actors like him, you know, it's, it's kind of. They, they are people who've emerged and they've got this kind of look or persona that's it's not it's not dashing handsome hero and it's not kind of weird either it's like they've got a really adaptable look mm. and um, they become the the character actors really of uh, of their generation yeah uh, and uh, they it's a it's it's a rich career if you can be that you know second line of the credits actor yes who yes. plays all these different roles yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. Like when you're talking about the 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 stars, right, of mm. the studio time, I I think there's no stars anymore. There's like no, you, you know, no. in terms of like you know, probably Tom Cruise is probably like the last of that kind of movie star kind of yeah. uh, of person where everyone knows, oh, it's a Tom Cruise movie. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's that that whole time of people going to the movies to yeah. see. Yeah, there are, I don't. There are people who. There are actors who remind me of old, you know, of the glamorous era. I think Margot Robbie's like that. She's, she reminds you of the glamorous actresses right. of, a, of a bygone era, and yet she's very modern, you know, and she's mm -hmm. kind of like part of the modern industry. You know, right, the, right. Um, you know, t time, times move on, and, and um, I don't know what's, you know, happening. Will we see movies shown in theaters anymore? Scorsese tries to do deals with Netflix where, okay, you can show my movie, but it must do five Cin weeks in the theater before sure, or and all sure. of that sort of thing. But there is something about going to the cinema and oh. having that communal experience. You, it can't be, uh, yeah, you can't, you can't really replace that. When you, know, when, when you can just pause something and go and make a cup of tea, it's a bit different, isn't it? Um, right. Uh, you just I, need to be have the theatrical experience and seeing it on the big screen that's why yeah. i love going to the orpheum and seeing the retro screenings yeah, i yeah. saw lawrence of arabia on the big screen yeah. uh, last year and just saw ghostbusters last week at oh, the orpheum oh, oh, yeah. and it's great just it being in an audience too having yeah. that having that communal yeah, yeah. connection yeah. to what's going on yeah yeah well, speaking of going back, to going way Oops. back is the selection <laughs> of your your book yeah well, which is uh, which is a new book, but yes. tackling uh, older. A new book by a very good um, comedian, David Mitchell, and 
he is actually. A, I think he he majored in history at uh, one of the one of the big universities, um, and uh, he never became an official historian. And so, I have a love of the history of the crowned heads of Europe and the intrigue, like from 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 sort of. Um, the Dark Ages, on through medieval times mm. and on through the kind of uh, Renaissance, and uh, the, the the crowned heads of Europe are the most warped bunch of violent <laughs> criminals of all time. And to read their stories has always been fascinating to me. Mm. Um, they, they, it, it's a. Uh, the history of the, of the United Kingdom, in particular, is very checkered because it has been so affected by the the the, the different um, invasions, not not necessarily the um, the the uh, violent invasions of being conquered. I think the last one was Sir William the Conqueror in 1066, but invasions of other people coming and imposing their languages on what has eventually become the English language, because mm. the English language is a very modern, very bastardised, doggerel language because it's made up of so many different influences from different places. So I've always loved the stories of the kings and queens, you know, marrying their second cousins or first cousins or, you know, and marrying off, you know, 13-year-old girls being sent to marry some 60-year-old guy to form an alliance so that the uh, the the uh, territory of Anjou can be annexed by somebody else, you know. Right. It's just so ludicrous and... Um, Luckily, David Mitchell has written a history book from a comedian's point of view. I mean, mm. it's a serious history book about um, actual events that took place. But it's, um, it's done with his commentary. Mm. And, um, and a great title too, Unruly. Yes, Unruly. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got this uh, ball of a, the sort of... A, the crown. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, with yeah, a the... ticking sort of like a Balkan bomb of some yes, kind. Yes, <laughs> yes. Right. Um, and uh, yes, I've... I've um, I particularly liked him, uh, David Mitchell, as, as an actor in Peep Show. Uh, yes. And uh, I think that's very, very funny. Yeah. Because he, he always plays the nerdy uh, a character and does it very well. And, he's, and he, um, most of his comedy shtick is about being that nerdy and particular and finicky kind of person. But mm. he kind of, kind of lets himself go here and he's got wonderful... Um, uh, comments that go along with the actual stories about, you know, what they did, what Henry the First and Henry the Second did, and you know who they had killed, and and um, how how so and so came to win the crown by all the the uh, the the court manoeuvrings and mm. so on. So he there's all that intrigue, but always with his kind of modern humour take on it. Yeah, and um, it's it's. You really have to read the book to fully appreciate but <laughs> there's a passage that I thought just sort of demonstrates how frank and open he is. Um, uh, so he, there, there was um, early on, and this is pre-William the Conqueror, there was, um, there was a king in England, he was a northern king when England was still sort of, kind of fragmented called King Canute. And most people have heard of King Canute, mm. and he was supposed to have um, uh, proved that he was fallible by his his followers said, go and turn the tide back. And he sat by the sea and said, stop to the tide, but it still came in. He said, see, I'm just a human being. <laughs> but King Canute has always been uh, spelt C-A-N-U-T-E, King Canute. The actual spelling of his name in his old Norse name was C-N-U-T. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's great for dyslexic. So yeah, it looks like a typo. Of some kind. So David Mitchell says, uh, <laughs> "Oh yes, these have been written with no doubt more in the pipeline. Rude pipeline could mean rectum about why slang references <laughs> to vaginas are deemed hugely offensive, while slang references to penises are considered less fulsomely impolite. But for me, the presence of a king called Canute." C-N-U-T, in all the history books, is the culmination of a long journey made by children, which begins with the discovery of the word poo, continues through noticing the missing I on every to-let sign, they've even left a gap for it, and reaches its greatest joy with the widespread usage of the word bosom in hymn lyrics. That he really taught you like eight and nine-year-old boys did used to giggle at that. <laughs> the bottom, in brackets fart, line is this. I don't want to become someone who will blithely carry on 
when a king's name is as close to the word cunt as Canute's is. If I get to the point where that amusement is lost on me, the fact that a big, important, serious king is very, very nearly called King Cunt, King <laughs> Cunt the Great or Great Big Cunt, then I think an important part of me will have died. <laughs> so he writes a, a factual history uh, of King Canute, um, but you know where he's coming from when he's, he's got... The, the, some of the funniest things in, in this book are his notes on the illustrations, and I don't know, it's a bit difficult to to uh, to get it unless you show the illustrations. Sure, sure. But he's got some, uh, because there's medieval pictures, are, are you, they've always been rather strange, and certainly early medieval art was really kind of cartoonish in a way. You know, yeah, it wasn't sure. very good. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the representations of the kings and queens, you know, in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century, they, it's almost they were pretty much the same. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. What's the difference between that queen and that queen there? You know, and so he's able, to, he's able to take the piss out of all that. But it fulfills uh, my desire to have a, uh, a look at this intrigue that goes on and the... And the and the stories of intrigue amongst all those um, royal families is it really is more devious than anything any scriptwriter could mm. ever come up with. Mm. It's unbelievable. But it's interesting how the people in the court and the public accept it. Like you just look at Henry yeah. VIII. I don't want to be married to her anymore. Yeah. All right, off with your head. Next one. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm over her now. Off with your head. Uh, like, yeah, just uh, that alone, you'd uh, go. The reason for so executing her? She's a whore. And she's also guilty of incest with her brother. That was part of the charge of Anne Boleyn. Right. But, <laughs> but says who? You know, says, 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 says they, him. They <laughs> just make it up. They yeah. make up the charge. Yeah. And they, uh, be it treason, whatever it is, they just make it up, chop the head off. But the absurdity yeah. of yeah. that, like to be yeah. in that court and looking at that going, yeah. what? And if you, you were know? guilty of really dirty treason, then up until it's only a few hundred years ago, and this is in England, mm. you could be hung, drawn and quartered which means you get hanged by the neck but cut down before you're dead. Mm. Then your body is sliced open while you're still alive and your entrails are pulled out. Mm. And then your limbs, your arms and legs are tied to four horses who set off in opposite directions and pull your body apart. Who the right. fuck could think up right. that and actually not only think it up but do it? Do it, it. yeah. It's, like, it's worse than Freddy Krueger. It's, it's, you know, it's worse like, than anything you can think of. Yeah. And it was just, oh, yes, well, he's a traitor, he deserves it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, half the time, he or she wasn't a traitor. It was right. Just, uh, yeah, drummed up enough information. Conven or drummed up convenient yeah. way of getting someone out of the way. And, yeah. Uh, and any, any monarch who felt threatened by the presence of a relative who somewhere along the family tree might make a claim to the throne, they're just... Uh, yeah, see you later. Mm. Which is like the court jester, you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Get rid of the family. Yeah, I'm now yeah. king. Oh, what? There's a baby. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I suppose there's some horrible uh, e echoes of it in um, Scorsese's latest movie, where the uh, the idea mm. the idea was to not only befriend and ingratiate yourself with a whole Native American tribe, but marry into them mm -hmm. once they've signed over their oil rights, murder them. Yeah. It's yeah. unbelievable. Uh, right. It's, it's like, it's, it's surely one of the most hideous crimes of all time. Mm. And mm. yet very few of us knew about it. I didn't. Right. Mm. No, about what happened to the Osage. Yeah, no, I, w I wasn't familiar to that extent. No, so, yeah. Like with how it was done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So human, human beings are capable of the most atrocious things and they're incapable of producing breathtaking beauty right how do you reconcile those two that yin aspects? and yang yeah yeah, yeah. it's a, a but i'm i'm consistently disappointed thinking i, I always think oh yeah we'll get to that point you know like yeah. you know like john lennon tried his best look yeah. what happened to him yeah, yeah you know you look at uh, martin luther king tried his best Look what happened to him. Yeah. Anyone that comes along with, you know, an answer that you look at, yeah, that's an ethical, yeah. you know, way to uh, way to approach yeah. the world and approach others. They don't, you know. Or a new approach to life. You know, I come from a generation that um, grew up thinking, all right, well, they've had their Second World War. The previous generation are not, are not getting this right. You know, maybe there's a different way. You know, maybe... Maybe we could just um, all realise that we're, we're brothers and sisters on this planet and um, 
you know, we've we've got to stop this. Mm. We've got to stop this. Uh, and you know, I, I, I look at the world today, and I th it's more on the brink of absolute conflagration than it has been at any time in my life. Mm. I think. Mm. You know, I was born after uh, the Second World War, so it was the um, aftermath of that hung around all my childhood of the fifties, and then my, all my all my kind of um, uh, philosophical influences were of the new peace generation and mm. we thought well surely yes we've got to do something to fight for this you know mm. peace you know, e equality all of these things that we we talked and and sang about in in the in the 60s um they this they still they still exist those notions still exist there are still people who live their lives in a good way but mm. up at the top end mm. we've just put monsters in power why we do that I know. I don't know. Well, you look I, at it. You know, I'm sorry, but I love the United States. I, it, it's a cultural phenomenon. And in mm. my childhood, I saw kids going to high school in in open topped Cadillacs with sweaters with big letters on, and I thought that's the life I want. And I really loved mm. America. I still do. Really like so much about America. There's so much I admire about America. And I look at the two contenders for the top job, and I think. That's all you can find, you know. I can't believe that we're doing this again. No, when four years ago, again, I was thinking we're even this. repeating it. Right, four years later, you had four years to get your shit together and yeah. this again. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's, I, I think, as John Lennon said, America has got the best and worst of everything. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's true. Yeah, it's, that's true. Uh, it does yeah, have excess. that. But, but I think it's important that you know, like your your great 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 grandfather, <laughs> yeah. you know, he he had a, a an ethical noble pursuit in yes. his work. Um, those people and, have uh, always existed. Yes, uh, and you know, you're a great guy, John. The world, <laughs> the world needs that balance of, uh, uh, of, of that. Uh, you yeah. know, so we've all got to try. Keep on fighting the good fight. Yeah. Well, it's I'll been try. great chatting with you, John. Uh, Thanks, John. Uh, I've it's enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been, been fabulous. And, it's great. And I look forward to seeing you on stage I in the new you production. Get thousands of followers uh, uh, from the, this. When yeah. they see John when Waters this, on this, we're in. Thank you, mate. Thanks, buddy.